Hello? Jessica Francis Victor. Yes, this is she. This is Jay Michaels. If I'm on the line, you're on the air. Hi, how are you? <laughs> Good, and yourself? <laughs> I'm doing great. I uh, seem to have surprised you. I'm like I'm like Ed McMahon with a check for you at the door or something like that. <laughs> um, my sister was on the other line, but I don't know if I'm going to be able to merge it, so it may just be me. <laughs> okay, that's totally cool. Okay. That's totally cool. So how are you? Oh, I thought you were going to try to merge. Never mind. Um, I'm great. No, I'm won't. absolutely great. How's everything with you? I'm doing I'm doing really well. Um, I've had a fever for four days, so I don't know what that's about. But I'm finally coming down from that. Well, it must be from all the pollen outside, from all those dandelions you've had to deal with. I know. They're just blowing around. <laughs> you should be congratulated and praised to high heaven. There you are. You have a brand new musical that's coming into one of the finest cabarets in New York, Feinstein's 54 Below. I am so thrilled. We are so incredibly, incredibly excited. The plot sounds amazing. You're 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 giving us you're giving us a very dramatic story, it seems. A very modern, very topical story with, with gorgeous music. Tell our listeners all about the show. So, um the story is a story of Jane and she's a high school senior and she's grown up in a little bit of a difficult environment because her mother um, has paranoid schizophrenia, and as a result, unbeknownst to Jane, she's developed a, the mother has developed a drug addiction. Oh, my gosh. Um, it's actually a really common thing. It's called a dual diagnosis, and uh, it's really common for people of untreated mental health issues to develop a drug addiction. And Jane's father has left, and her brother's the military, so she's kind of been left unknowingly becoming the caregiver of her mother. Oh, my gosh. Um, and Jane is very smart, intelligent, and she has this dream to go off to college, and she's accepted to the college of her dreams. And she's left sort of making the decision as her mother um, really kind of struggles with the idea of her leaving and Jane realizing the extent of what her mother is facing, of whether to leave or to stay and kind of become the lifelong caregiver of her mother. Oh my gosh, what what a what a horrible crossroad you you put this character at. She can she can go off to be to be everything she dreamt of, but that's at, literally it, uh, she's paying for that with the life of her mother. Right, it's it's a near impossible decision, and the story is actually based on one of my my dear dear friends. Oh, um, it's based on a true story. Yeah, we, oh. we changed a lot of the names and things um, to to sort of protect some of the people. But of course, she, um, she dealt with this exact situation, and it it it, it is a constant lifelong toll that it takes on her. You know, and nobody is the bad guy in the situation. That's what I think makes the story so powerful. Is that there isn't some villain coming in and and ruining somebody's, you know, existence or making their choice harder. It's just the reality of what life is and what life has given them. And um, so she's been so gracious and kind talking to me about this and so open about her experiences. So I feel very grateful that she's entrusted us with the telling of this story. You're, you're doing something quite wonderful by, by bringing up the point that nobody is a villain in this because it's very easy to demonize someone with, with mental illness. It's very easy to, 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 be a, to give a summary judgment of someone who, who is addicted to any form, to any substance. So, so by, by making them all sympathetic characters, you're really opening the door for, for discussion and for understanding, which is great, which is really great. Um, now, now your sister, uh, what role does your sister have in this? So my sister is the composer. Ah, that's um, what I thought. Oh, that's so great. Yes. Oh, my gosh. Uh, so she has created the music. Yes. She's been oh, the composer and the lyricist. And she is primarily, um, 
she works out of Nashville as a songwriter. So this is her first musical. <gasps> wow. Okay. Maiden Voyage in New York. She must be freaking out. She is. She is <laughs> so thrilled. Good. Um, and she has such a unique um, voice as an as a songwriter and an artist. I feel, especially in the musical theater realm, for the music, a lot of people who have heard it have said, it sounds like nothing else we have heard before, um, which is such an exciting thing to hear. I, th I think what you don't want to hear is this sounds like a thousand things that we've heard before. <laughs> we, we, we hear that all the time. We hear, oh, boy, this show is just like Chorus Line. This show is just like Phantom of the Opera. Isn't it wonderful? Um, it's great to hear that we're, we're, we're stepping into a, a, a real paradigm shift. We're stepping into a real uh, uh, difference in musical theater. So I'm really thrilled yeah. to hear that. Um, uh, what's it like to work with your sister? Is this the first time you've worked with your sister? It is. It is the first time that we have worked together, <laughs> and it is so much fun. Um, we, you know, we've both been artists most of our lives, but she's always sort of been on the songwriting, singing path, and I've primarily done theater and been a writer. And so um, when we were approached by my friends about sort of taking this on, we were a little nervous jumping in, but it's honestly been the most incredible journey to see her work as a professional. You know your siblings, but I had never seen her in a work environment. And she's just so open and so smart and so able to adjust quickly. It's just been incredible. I bet she'd say the same thing about you. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> it's really great that, that the respect you have for each other has actually grown during this. I can't, I can't, I can't talk to my sister on the phone. Forget about working with her. So, so <laughs> to hear that that two siblings are joining forces together and, and making music uh, is really wonderful. Now, you, you've answered a question of mine. Was this your idea? Was this her idea? Did uh, it sounds like someone brought you into it and thus brought both of you into it? Yes. Yeah, so it was. Um, it was the brainchild of, of my good friend and mine. We were just <clears throat> speaking one day sort of about her journey and, and what happened. And this idea came out of it. And then I thought, well, I'm going to call Colleen and see if she's interested. And that's, and that's sort of how it happened. Um, and I can't believe we're where we are. I mean, that moment where you think I was a year and a half ago or two years ago, I was sitting in a living room talking about this. And now we have a piece of art that obviously isn't done. Nothing's ever done. You're constantly changing and moving and revising. And oh, it's, it's a living right. thing. It's breathing. So, of course, right. yes. But it's going to get to be seen. And what a cool moment that is for all of us. That's really incredible. That's really incredible. And um, uh, and you've picked, you've picked Feinstein's for this uh, to do it. Um, why Feinstein's? I, I I can give you my gushy reason, but why did you pick Feinstein's? So it's really interesting. I I've been there several times, and I, I've seen a couple of my friends do a concert there um, earlier this year. And I thought to myself, what a nice intimate environment this is to sort of hear and listen and be in the moment of music. Mm -hmm. And I felt for us to get feedback to also put it out there in a way where it could be received um, for this first time, this environment was going to serve us um, now, now as you, opposed to a stale room, you know? Right. Uh, now, you're saying intimate environment. Is, uh, is this the kind of musical that is that way, that, that, will, that, that best survives in a small place where the audience can, can really be up close and personal with the artists? I think it's tough. I think it has, this musical has the capacity to being on a large scale stage. Mm -hmm. um, I think it, as it has grown, into what it has become. It now has nine characters, um, and it, it is growing in terms of the scope of it. I can see it in a bigger and bigger place. But I think for us to grasp how the story affects audiences at this point, 
smaller venues are going to help us in this development phase. Mm -hmm. So, so, so we're watching, we're watching the dandelion bloom. We're watching it, it, it grow. You know, here, here, here it goes. Now it's nine characters. Then there might be a chorus. Then there might be something more. You're watching it. It really grows. So you're really heaped into the development of all this. This is, this is really, it must be so energizing because every rehearsal probably is something brand new, even for you guys. Absolutely. And what's been amazing for us as it develops, honestly, is as we've had different people reading it and different actors come in and have had different audiences sort of just sit and listen the responses that we get based on people's individual experiences and how kind of universal the story is, but it's helped us so much because we've gotten pieces that, that people have felt like, Oh, it's too much. I can't handle it. It's too close. Mm -hmm. Or I think you can push further here. Or the hardest one was um, we've gotten a couple of people said it's just so close to to their experiences it's just really hard that's a really interesting thing that you say because it i could see it uh soliciting two responses from you it must be quite wonderful to say oh great look we're authentic but but how do you feel inside when someone when someone comes to you teary eyed and says okay yes this is this is my life too this is the life of a loved one too how does how does that feel to know that you you've you've touched someone on that level it is it is both amazing and very tough. I mean, I think one of the goals in creating a piece like this is hoping that we can open these discussions that that people can can say this is the life that I had to live and it was lonely and it was hard because that was true of my friend and and I think one of her goals was hoping that this story was told, so it wasn't this lonely cave that people feel they're in. But I think as an artist, when somebody says that to you, you feel a responsibility to say, you know, these are the answers or this is the, and all we can say are these are resources, but there truly is no answer. And I think that's one of the points of the piece, but it is so hard. But all you can do is listen, you know. Do you find that the now now obviously the 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 notion of the 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 envelope pushing play the story put on stage or on film of of tense subject matter has been going for for decades um mm -hmm. but really only since maybe the seventies when you get right down to it that musicals have taken on that that mantle um do you think that adding music do you think that adding the emotion that songs bring uh helps the subject matter helps people digest it more? Like, do you think that more people will listen to it, that it's sung, as opposed to just a drama that is told to them? Yes. And I think what the musical gives us, too, is, you know, we're talking so much about the dramatic elements of it. There's quite a bit of levity in it, too. Jane has a great best friend, Gabby, and, and she has these incredible upbeat songs that are fun and encapsulate the teenage experience and allow you to sort of have a moment of escape mm -hmm. from this very dramatic event and give you a sense of what Jane's life can be as well. And um, in addition to that, I feel that the emotional moments are captured so well in Colleen did such a great job of capturing that emotion in the melody in the way that the move, music moves you through that the journey in some ways is easier to take. We're, we're almost hearing the emotion as opposed to the actual words. So it's sort of softer to us. Right. Interesting. Very interesting. Um, uh, now, now you mentioned about how this is based on a true story. Has the, uh, the person who lived through it, have they seen a version of this yet? Have they sat through a rehearsal or seen, a workshop or anything? Yes. Yes. Wow. Yes. Um, wow. It is an incredibly emotional experience for that person. What was um, it like for you, first of all, to see them sitting there as their life story unfolds on that stage? Well, they were in the room for our first reading, and I have to tell oh. you, every person in the room Every person who was reading, 
every person who was listening, they didn't know <sighs> that it was her story. But but you did for whatever reason, right? For whatever reason, they could feel it, or just the emotional weight of it all was so strong on everybody that by the end, I mean, they had enveloped her in a hug. Oh, that's you great! Know? Oh, that's great! So <laughs> it it is. It is quite a journey, but it's also so powerful to see people embrace her. How old is, is quote, Jane in real life? She is 21 right now. Okay. Um, we, I, it, it, I, I am not a millennial, and I don't play one on TV, <laughs> but... I am seeing that the millennial, uh, the millennial uh, concept, the millennial way of life seems to be taking great hold of the arts these days. I, more than most generations, more than most, I'm, I'm a baby boomer, so, so more than most generations since then, I see the millennial concept taking hold more. Um, do you feel musicals like yours are, are more embraced now in the millennial thought pattern? Or do you think, uh, or do you think this could have happened 10 years ago, 20 years ago? Or do you think now is the right time for this kind of subject matter to, to hit the musical theater? I think, I think for a couple reasons, it's the right time. You know, I think with Rent, you started to kind of see the, the musical theater waves changing. Right. But I really right. think in the last 10 years, the audience has started to grow again into younger people, even into high school students. Now, I mean, you've seen what happened with Dear Evan Hansen and Be More Chill. I mean, high mm -hmm. school students are just embracing these pieces of theater and kind of owning them, which is a beautiful thing because I think for a long time, that had gone away. Um, what I think, what I think is so important about Dandelion is this is a female story about a teenage girl who isn't a mean girl. You know, she isn't. Um, she's truly just trying to live her life, and I think we're starting to see these female stories that are more positive happen but i think they're important you know as women we're we are kind of trained to be caregivers and i think a lot of the discussion around that hasn't happened yet especially for high schoolers and young college girls i know they didn't have it didn't happen 10 to 12 years ago when i was um that age so i just think what a time now for us to be talking about women about what we teach our young women coming up, and for musical theater. Do you think you're making more of a statement that there's always been leading women characters in musicals yes. going way, way back when? There's always been leading oh, yeah. characters that were, that were women, uh, whether they're comedic uh, uh, or, or serious characters, whatever, there was, there was always the leading women character. Do you think it's different now? Because you, 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 you describe this as saying female-driven. Not female characters, not a female lead or something like that, like we're used to. Female driven. Do you think there's, there's another paradigm shift that your show is offering? Sort of like, like we are now looking at the world through, through the feminine, uh, mystique, through the feminine eyes? I absolutely think so. And I think, I think there is, um, there have been a lot of great female characters in the past. There's been a lot of, uh, a lot of really great women and some shows that were female driven, but I think what I am seeing now is a more in, is more embracing in the community, in the world really, of these stories through the eyes of women and and of young women too. Mm -hmm. Um of of teenage of of young women, of teenage girls, of college age girls, because I think a lot of that narrative, for whatever reason, has been lost or become very stereotypical. Um, and 
I, I am starting to see that shift, but I think it's so important that we, we encourage that shift. I think the prom is a great example of encouraging that shift. Right. I mean, in that musical, you saw teenage girls who were mature, who were speaking, who were growing in a positive way. And I think those are the kind of things that I'm really excited about seeing. And I feel like Dandelion falls into that same sort of mindset. The, what I've read about your show and in listening to you speak, I think the, the big thing that you contribute in terms of that is we've always had female characters, but they've been written by men. So, so it's sort of like, okay, here is the female entry into this thought process. It looks like, like your show is, is amongst those that are really changing the thought process, not just, oh, look, here's a musical with women. And here's, here, the whole thought process has changed. We're looking at it from a completely different psyche now. And I, I think that's amazing. And I think it's absolutely wonderful that it's happening. I'm so, I'm so glad that your show is, is doing this. Um, okay. Where do you want it to go? There you go. You did it at Feinstein's wonderful two drink minimum. You're all thrilled. Uh, marvelous standing ovations. The audience loves it. Everyone's crying and hugging each other. What do you do the next morning? Oh, I know. <laughs> so, yeah. uh, I think, um, our big goal is obviously to get it on its feet in in the best capacity that we can, um, whether that might be an off-Broadway setting, a regional setting. Um, we are so open. We're, we're looking for a theater, a producer who's excited about the story, who's open to talking to us, because we also know we're in a workshop phase. You know, we, we are open to sort of taking the journey wherever it leads us but our major priority is getting this story up on a stage where it can be seen that's great um <laughs> oh that's great so that's where we are <laughs> i'm I, again and, and this this goes back to what i'm saying about the, the the female sensibility i i've spoken to people so many times about this and they all oh yeah well we want to take it to an equity house and we want to make a hundred thousand dollars on this there's there's one kind of mentality but you're you're so different you're just saying i want my story told i want these these characters to become the learning experience for for untold audiences uh which is marvelous which is absolutely marvelous um, how and did that's you go? Exactly it. I mean, that's we're we're storytellers, and this story is just I feel so important. And I know there's someone out there who wants to help us tell it. So we just have to find that person. You there know. You go. <laughs> I think you're going to have easier luck than you imagine because you're you're really drawing people in with a with amazing things. Now, speaking of important and drawing people in and everything like that, now you had to cast this. Uh, obviously, it's a huge responsibility to put together a cast because you need you need it's it's almost alchemy. You need to get you know gold in that room. Um, was there more responsibility because these are real people? Because you knew them when you looked at the actors? Did you did you say no, no, you 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 don't have the same that that she does? Did you did you was it more difficult to cast a show like this? Yes, um, it was. It was very difficult and. Um, we finally finished casting this week. Um, we were searching desperately for the person that we wanted to play. Oh my God, you're, you're still casting. You just finished casting. We just, (laughs) just cast Lila. We had everybody else, but we were, um, I mean, we've had people do it in the, in the reading and, but we were really specific about what we wanted for this specific specific um concert and so we we've had everybody else but we finally finally finished uh casting this week with our lila that's like a hollywood story it's like the show will not go on until we find the perfect people wow (laughs) oh that's we have to honor this person's mother you know that we i mean it's just so important that it was the right person to take on this responsibility. And so we found that person, <laughs> but it was a lot of hours and a lot of time. Okay. Let's, let's, let's talk the Hollywood thought for, for, for one brief second. My last question to you, when, when you found your Lila, when you found her in that room, I remember a movie uh, talking about how they created gone with the wind. And there was a scene where all of a sudden 
Vivian Lee walks in and, and you see all the producers sit there and go, I think she's the one. And it's this great big swirling moment. How did it feel when the entire ensemble came together and there you had all the members of your parable ready to go? What, what did it feel like when they were all in front of you at that reading, if you so, will, whenever you came together? Do you know that feeling where you've been holding your breath for a long period of time <laughs> and then you just release? <laughs> it's that moment. It's like, oh. I'm breathing again because it is alchemy and you just don't know. You don't know um, how things are going to work until they do or don't. So, (laughs) you know, you have to. um, So, yeah, it it feels like I hadn't been breathing and now I am again. (laughs) It's really funny. One of my favorite quotes is from Steven Spielberg, who said, the only emotion a producer should feel is relief. Uh, so, so you've done it. Um, and speaking of done it, you, you have this amazing musical that's coming into one of the finest cabaret spaces in the middle of Manhattan. Um, I will make sure our listeners know exactly when to go see this one night only. Oh my God. Uh, the line's going to be around the block. Uh, 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 I wish you so much luck. May this become, may this become the jumping off point for all of you and for a whole new kind of musical theater. May this, may this literally change the face of musical theater, uh, uh, for all of us in New York and for all of us around, around the, the, the musical loving community. Uh, <laughs> thank you so much for chatting with me. I will make sure everyone knows where the show's going to be. And I really look forward to just crying bloody tears in the audience when I see it. <laughs> well, we're excited to have you there. And, um, and I hope you're, and I hope to everyone that you're able to make it out. We'd love to have you hear the story. Oh, you, you, you're going to break the fire laws in there. That's for sure. That's for <laughs> sure. This is wonderful. All the best to you, and and maybe we'll get your sister on the line at another occasion to chat with her about her thoughts on this. Uh, uh, but thanks so much, Jessica, and and I wish you all the best with the show. Thank you so much. My pleasure. <laughs> I will talk to you soon. Okay. Ciao. Bye.